Ronald J. Daniels has served as the 14th president of Johns Hopkins University since 2009. Under his leadership, Hopkins continues its preeminence in education, in patient care, in innovative discovery, and has continued its more than 40-year span as the recipient of more competitively allocated federal research funding than any other university in the country. During his tenure, President Daniels has focused his effort on several key areas, strengthening, strengthening interdisciplinary collaboration in research and education, expanding student access and support, enhancing the Hopkins experience for undergraduate and graduate students, deepening the university's partnerships with neighbors in Baltimore, and supporting economic and social innovation. And these priorities continue to shape the strategic vision for Johns Hopkins as it approaches its 150th anniversary. His remarks tonight will address one further priority during his presidency, and that is captured in the title of his 2021 book, What Universities Owe Democracy, co-authored with Grant Shreve and Philip Spector, and, and Grant is with us here tonight as well. President Daniels began his academic career as a scholar of law and economics. I'm not saying he's no longer, but that was his uh, first academic positions in the university. Prior to coming to Hopkins, he was the provost and a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. And prior to that, he was dean and professor of law at the University of Toronto. So I mentioned the, f the format. I do have to mention one distinguished uh, local civic leader who just entered the room. Um, Arizona State University has a wonderful honors college that we call Barrett, the Honors College, endowed by Craig and Barbara Barrett. And Ambassador Barbara Barrett is uh, with us, and so delighted that she can be here. And we'll, uh, and we'll be able to hear this uh, final session. So for this, uh, keynote address on purposeful pluralism, the future of the university in American democracy. Please join me in welcoming Ronald J. Daniels. Well, uh, uh, good afternoon. Really delighted to be here at your annual conference and thank you, Paul, for the invitation and for your very kind introduction. Uh, my remarks uh, here this afternoon is focused on the obligations of institutions of higher education to liberal democracy, which, as Paul said, I explore in my recent book, which I co-authored with uh, Grant uh, Shreve and Phil Spector, What Universities Owe Democracy. The idea for this book were seeded several years ago when it became undeniable that liberal democracy was backsliding. Yet I'll confess that early in January 2021, as, as I was in the process of completing the final revisions to the manuscript, I was clinging to an ember of hope. Here in the US, the 2020 election was, according to the Department of Homeland Security, among the most secure elections in our history. Abroad, the largest European democracy seemed to be mustering resistance against the forces of anti-democratic populism. I even allowed myself for a moment to ponder the possibility, would my book still be relevant uh, by the time that it was published? But then of course, on January 6th, we all watched in horror as approximately 2,000 American citizens stormed the US Capitol in an attempt to halt the Senate's expected approval of the Electoral College vote. This was an assault on the symbols of our democracy as the, well as the very foundations of our democratic process. And although the insurrection was stoked by those in power, it was driven by American citizens who uniformly demonstrated a profound disregard for, a profound ignorance of, and in some cases, a profound malice towards the peaceful transition of power that is the hallmark of our democracy. It underscored for me the painful fact that the threats, the threats facing democracy were not only palpably real, but potentially growing more dire. Following last fall's midterm elections, some pundits have once again begun to posit, however tentatively, that maybe now the fever has finally broken. Maybe, just maybe, democracy is on the mend. But I'm not so sure. While anti-democratic populism has been held in abeyance in some places and in some elections, 
I continue to believe that liberal democracy is more vulnerable than many of us ever imagined. It still remains true over the last, pack, last past decade, according to the Varieties of Democracy Institute, the share of the world's population living in democracies has plummeted from around 50% to 30%. That free and fair elections remain in many countries of the world under threat. And that in countries from Brazil to Hungary to Russia, authoritarian leaders have fueled disinformation campaigns, dismantled checks on their power, and waged unjust, undefensible wars. Our moment demands that we step up in the defense of the democratic experiment. This is, I believe, the responsibility not only of its citizens, but of its core institutions. Now, over the years, I've occasionally quizzed friends and colleagues what they think those core indispensable institutions are for liberal democracy. You can imagine a lot of fun at parties. The answers invariably are the same. The independent media, the courts, competitive politics, competitive political parties, and so on. And colleges and universities rarely make the cut. But as I argue in my book, this is a grave oversight. Colleges and universities are critical, even indispensable, to the maintenance of healthy, flourishing democracies. And just as important, liberal democracy is the best soil for thriving universities. This is in no small part because universities and liberal democracy share so many values. Each places a premium of, on freedom of uh, speech and thought, on tolerance for dissent, of dissent, on the free flow of information, and on the vigorous exchange of ideas grounded in reason and animated by experience. Nearly 90 of the top 100 universities in the world, according to Times Higher Education, are located in democracies. And studies have shown time and time again that higher levels of college education make democracies more likely to endure and autocracies more likely to democratize. Yet, for as vital as higher education is to democracy, our colleges and universities have, in my view, neglected their full obligations to uh, this idea, to this enterprise. In my book, I outline four distinct areas in which colleges and universities support liberal democracy, and I reflect on the ways in which I think they have fallen short of their full potential. These ways start as follows. First, colleges and universities advance social mobility by launching students up the socioeconomic ladder. This builds trust and confidence in this experiment. They call the colleges and universities steward facts. They cultivate expertise, and they check the exercise of public and indeed private power. They educate students in the values, history, skills, and aspirations necessary for good democratic citizenship, and they foster pluralism by bringing people together from vastly different backgrounds, beliefs, and perspectives, and teach them how to engage with one another. Now today, I wanna to focus on these last two functions, civic education and pluralism. On our campuses, universities have failed, I believe, to foster a robust cul culture of dialogue and debate across differences. Likewise, in our curricula, we have only intermittently and half-heartedly sought to educate students not only in the core tenets of citizenship, but also, as we've heard several times today, I understand, in the structures, history, and functions of democratic institutions. Today, I want to diagnose where I think universities have faltered and to outline a few recommendations for a renewal of our civic mission and for a more purposeful pluralism on our campuses. So let me start with civic education. For decades, higher education as a sector has largely been content to let K to 12 schools bear practically the full burden of an education in democracy. Yet we know that quality civics in primary and secondary schools in this country is uneven at best. According to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, 
only about 25% of US students demonstrate proficiency in civics, and only slightly more than 20% have actually received dedicated instruction in civics. This is a deeply troubling, deeply disquieting, disquieting finding, especially, especially in a moment when less than half of American adults can actually name all three branches of government. I've seen these deficits firsthand. Several years ago, uh, we at Johns Hopkins piloted a panel during student orientation focused on academic freedom and free speech. We enlisted faculty from across the ideological and disciplinary spectrums to explain the significance of this core value, not only to the academy, but indeed to our democracy. The panel included both English professor Lawrence Jackson, who is a fierce and incisive critic of the structures of power, as well as military historian, former dean of our School of International Studies and a formal official in the second Bush administration, Elliot Cohen. Now at first I have to confess that I worried that the content would be far too rudimentary for our students. Surely they've been exposed to all these ideas before, would they just find this uh, too dispiriting to be educated in the first week that they were at Johns Hopkins in these ideas that were so rudimentary. But when I approached several of the students, freshman students who were in attendance afterwards to survey what they thought of the experience, they said, almost to a person, that until that moment when we held this panel, they had never been exposed to the case for free speech in their high schools. Everything in that session turned out to be novel to them. I was stunned. A couple of years later, during an undergraduate seminar that I was teaching, largely uh, using it as a springboard for the development of the ideas that uh, we developed in the book, I asked my students if any of them had learned about core democratic ideas and institutions in high school. A dispiritingly small number of hands went up, and most of those were at half-mast. Clearly, when it comes to civics, our K-12 schools are not doing enough. Now, it seems to me that the responsibility for remedying this situation must fall on the entire educational continuum. And this includes colleges and universities. We simply cannot, must not sit on the sidelines of this responsibility. My view is that we should be doing vastly more to educate our students in the history and theory of democracy and its institutions, to, to cultivate in them the ability to reason critically and discern true information from false information, to foster a commitment to ideas of tolerance and equality, and finally, to inspire them towards collective action and civic friendship. Now, every time I've made this claim in print, there is someone without fail, who says more often than not in the form of a tweet, the colleges simply have no business wearing the mantle of civic education. Colleges prepare students for careers, not for democratic citizenship. We are and should not be in the business of values. That argument is, in my opinion, profoundly myopic. And it is also, it is also deeply ahistorical. As I was researching my book, I was struck to learn not only is a call for universities to be beacons for civic education not new, it is in fact almost as old as the nation itself. In 1790, George Washington delivered his first State of the Union address before a joint session of Congress. Compared to the marathon performance of modern presidents, Washington's remarks were mercifully short, only about 1,200 words. Given the speech's brevity, it is significant that 230 of those 1,200 words, or about one-fifth of the speech, were devoted to the importance of colleges and universities in a republic. Washington called on colleges and universities to promote the skills and values necessary for democratic citizenship, even suggesting that Congress consider establishing a national university devoted to such a purpose. And he assisted insisted that among the imp most important functions of higher education is to teach students, quote, to know and to value their own rights, to discern and provide against invasions of them, and to distinguish between oppression and the necessary exercise of lawful authority. 
I think we can all agree readily that these ideas, this enterprise is just important today as it was when Washington delivered those words. It's been 233 years since Washington's first State of the Union, yet colleges and universities have delivered on his call to action imperfectly and unevenly. Periods of advancement and innovation have been often followed by stagnation and regress. In the early 19th century, colleges, college presidents taught annual capstone courses in moral philosophy to graduating seniors, which were meant as a form of preparation for civic participation, for civic life. By the 1870s, these courses faded as emergent disciplines like political science, economics, and sociology became crucial sites of democratic education, as they should. However, because undergraduates also had so much more choice in what they studied, only a fraction of the students reaped the benefits of these fields' insights. The two world wars revitalized interest in the possibilities of widespread democratic education in the form of general education requirements. Indeed, after World War II, President Truman even convened a national commission on higher education and its role in democracy. In its report, the commission made the forceful claim that, quote, the first and most essential charge upon higher education is that at all levels and in all fields of specialization, it shall be the carrier of democratic values, ideals, and process. This is a stirring call. Yet in the decades that followed the Truman Report, colleges and universities have again led other priorities from shifting norms of faculty autonomy to undergraduate careerism to a quest for scientific dominance to take precedence over democracy. By the 1970s, democratic education at the university level had all but evaporated. Beginning in the 1980s, however, another renaissance in civics was underway with the advent of service learning and the founding of organizations like Compact, Campus Compact. Today, hundreds of institutes, centers, and offices of service learning operate at colleges and universities across the country. Because of these enduring efforts, service learning has become perhaps the single most important civic education movement in American history. The impact of this education I believe has been unequivocally positive. Studies show that service learning habituates students to volunteerism, makes them more tolerant, and teaches them leadership skills. But it is also true that service learning alone does not suffice as education in a democracy. Broadly speaking, service learning, despite its great accomplishments, doesn't seek to nurture in students an affinity for democracy as a system of popular governance or to instill in its students the knowledge necessary to engage fully with democratic institutions and processes. For universities to rely upon civic learning, service learning rather, as our sole form of civic education is inadequate. We must do more to ensure that our students are coming into contact with the coursework and the values, theory, history, and practices of democracy. For this reason, I have suggested that colleges and universities should institute what I call a democracy requirement. Now, this could take any number of possible forms, but should, I strongly believe, balance a rigorous investigation of the ways in which the democratic experiment in the United States and elsewhere has fulfilled its aspirations alongside a sober recognition of the ways in which democracy has fallen tragically short of its ideals of realizing equality, liberty, and opportunity for our society, especially for those who have been historically disenfranchised and marginalized on the basis of their identity. I do not hold the view that, as the culture wars would have us believe, 1776 and 1619 are so irredeemably opposed to one another that we cannot confront, frankly and honestly, the deep undercurrents of injustice that have been perpetuated across centuries in this country while also understanding the world historical achievements of democratic institutions and their aspirations. Our students can and should grapple with the contradictions, achievements, and paradoxes of this country. This is how we make better, more thoughtful, more engaged democratic citizens. 
Whatever this education looks like, it should be neither reactionary nor radical, but even-handed and comprehensive. And above all, it should provide students with the knowledge and the tools to renew democracy's promise. This is a tall order, but I think change is indeed possible. In fact, we've already begun to see real progress in colleges and universities in red and blue states alike, with liberal and conservative leaders at the helm and people who have taken up this cause. Purdue University recently instituted a new civic literacy examination requirement for graduation. Stanford has designed a citizenship course for first year students as a central part of their new core curriculum. Longwood University in Virginia has also launched a new curriculum designed around producing citizen leaders in a time of democratic erosion. At my own institution, Johns Hopkins, our SNF Agora Institute has helped to dramatically increase the number of courses in democracy we offer, many taught by luminaries like Yasha Monk and Pulitzer Prize winning Arthur and Applebaum. Additionally, we have for the past two years hosted a Democracy Day as part of our new student orientation. This event ensures that all of our incoming freshman students are given the opportunity to hear from local elected officials, to learn about opportunities for involvement, and to speak with a diverse cadre of faculty from divisions and departments across the institution in medicine, public health, education, and the social sciences and humanities about the challenges they see in their fields of intellectual endeavor facing democracy. Now, we still have more to do at Hopkins, but I'm encouraged by the progress we have made by harnessing the expertise and interest across our faculty. But of course, the formation of good democratic citizens doesn't end in the classroom. A democratic ethos needs to span every facet of campus life. Colleges and universities have a unique opportunity in this area. They are microcosms of a diverse, pluralistic society that brings students into meaningful contact with peers whose backgrounds and beliefs differ from their own. And I think this couldn't be more important, especially at this time in American history. A healthy, diverse democracy depends on interaction, dialogue, and vigorous contestation of values and ideas across a vast spectrum of experience. It needs to preserve the right for people to speak up, to protest, to tell their stories, and to hold and express opposing, even contentious views. And yet at this moment, citizens are ever more siloed, as we know from one another, and seem less and less able to communicate effectively across their differences. Americans, as we know, increasingly regard those with whom they disagree with distrust, and those who hold opposing political views, not as fellow citizens with whom they can engage and learn from, but moral enemies whose ideas are to be feared and silenced. For me, this is nowhere better distilled than in the fact that in the United States over the last 60 years, the share of Republicans and Democrats who say they will be upset if one of their children married a member of the opposing political party has skyrocketed from about 5% of each party to almost 40%. Perennial rivalries aside, colleges and universities have historically been among the institutions that have offered young people their first opportunity to leave the communities in which they grew up and interact with others from different racial, religious, regional, socioeconomic, and political backgrounds. This has been true for more than two centuries. Indeed, at key junctures in history, colleges and universities have in fact stood at the very vanguard of pluralistic education. In the 19th century, for instance, schools like Oberlin College in Ohio, and Brea College in Kentucky vigorously committed themselves to recruiting students across lines of race and gender, even when doing so put their very existence at threat. More than half of Brea's first class in 1866 were black students, and all students lived together, ate together, studied together, and debated one another. A visitor to the campus in 1870 marveled marveled that Berea students were able to discuss, quote, the most practical and the most radical questions with the utmost freedom. Other colleges and universities, albeit intermittently, continued to take up the mantle of inclusion in the decades that followed. With the advent of the Civil Rights Movement, many colleges and university leaders were on the front lines of advancing diversity at their schools, many in the face of intense and violent backlash. 
Thanks to efforts like those, as well as to the bold advocacy of so many students and faculty across the decades, American higher education has made undeniable strides in expanding access, addressing inequalities, although that progress has admittedly come too slowly and remains unfinished. On balance, however, our campuses are undeniably far more diverse than they've ever been, and that's something to celebrate. Yet, for all that colleges and universities have done for representation, they haven't fully cultivated in students that most important capacity in the spirit of Berea more than a century ago to engage with people across their differences. If anything, colleges and universities in this moment have been doing less and less to draw students together. In many institutions, students are allowed to choose where they live, whom they live with, where they dine, what classes to take. The evidence shows when given the, these choices, students, not surprisingly, choose to associate with people who look like them and who believe what they do. We have essentially given our students a pass to opt out of encounters with people dissimilar from themselves. At Hopkins, we've also found through survey data, data from graduating students that students are far less likely to engage with peers who hold different political beliefs than they are across other kinds of differences. This is really worrisome. And even when those encounters across difference do occur, they're more likely than ever to be superficial and fleeting, presenting little opportunity for self-reflection and reasonable substantive disagreement. If higher education wants to begin addressing concerns of ideological conformity or cancel culture, we first need to ensure that our students understand how to live alongside one another and to speak to one another about sensitive issues in our society. We need to nurture in them a spirit of civic friendship, that now seemingly quaint concept that Aristotle so highly prized. When I say civic friendship, I mean something closer to political philosopher Robert Talese's definition, which he describes as a capacity of people to treat each other as equals even when they regard each other as seriously mistaken and misguided in their political perspectives and judgments. You neither have to agree nor even particularly like your fellow citizens, but you do have to see them as equals, worthy of respect and the exchange of ideas. To my mind, the way to cultivate this disposition is to deliberately rethink how we shape student life on our campuses in such a way that promotes sustained encounters between students from different backgrounds without, of course, sacrificing necessary opportunity for students to connect with peers who do share similar identities. One of the first steps that I call for in my book is reinstating assigned roommates in the first year for first year student housing. As you know, it used to be common for universities to decide who students lived with. Indeed, the experience of meeting your freshman year college roommate for the first time was once a celebrated rite of passage, as I'm sure many in this room can attest. But over the past two decades, this practice fell into disfavor, as social media made it progressively easier for students to select their own roommates, all too frequently, as I said before, choosing peers who grew up in similar circumstances. Returning to assigned roommates may seem like a small, like a trivial intervention, but I think it can have an incredible impact on students' lives and attitudes. Research in both the United States and South Africa has shown that university students who live with peers from different backgrounds become more racially tolerant. There's also evidence that students' political attitudes shift in the direction of their roommates over time. To give one really striking example, a low or middle income student who lives with wealthy peers will tend on average to become more skeptical of progressive tax policies. Clearly, at least for those of my generation, the odd couple had a deeper message than we may have granted it. Whom you room with matters and can have a lasting impact on your own views as well as your ability to engage with others wholly dissimilar from yourself. Schools like Duke and Dartmouth have moved to assign roommates with very promising results. And at Hopkins, we just did the same a year ago. We're still in the early days of this move, but the student response has been largely uh, positive. Students crave experiences that allow them to encounter difference. 
but we have to give them the opportunities to have such experiences. And we should not stop there. In addition to enabling more diverse encounters for our students, universities also need to be modeling the kinds of interaction we want them to have in contending with difficult and contentious issues. For me, this is a reason to instill throughout our campuses a more robust culture of debate and dialogue. And part of this actually means hosting debates. Across the country, colleges and universities have become far too reliant on single speakers or panels of speakers who are often in broad agreement with one another. Indeed, one study found that most universities only sponsor about one event per year in which a public policy issue is debated by people holding divergent views. When we think of all the high-profile student protests of the past decade, so many of which are subject of national scrutiny and public hand-wringing, it is all too often a situation that has risen in the context of a single speaker event. What would change if we began incentivizing more actual debate and committing ourselves to demonstrating greater disagreement in our public events? At Hopkins, again, we're trying this. We recently launched a debate initiative that will model this kind of engagement for our community throughout multiple debates between intellectual leaders, as well as providing resources to student groups that are willing to host these kinds of debates on their own. Two weeks ago, we hosted our first marquee debate. The debaters were two political strategists from opposite sides of the ideological spectrum. On the left was Simone Sanders, who previously served as Bernie Sanders' national press secretary, and the right was the famed architect of uh, George Bush's presidential campaign, uh, campaigns, Karl Rove. The topic being debated was the need for more voting rights legislation. We polled the audience for their views on the issue before and after the debate, and although Karl was truly fighting an uphill battle with an audience consisting overwhelmingly of Democrats in the heart of Baltimore City, by the end of the conversation, he had actually shifted the views of a considerable number of people in the room. Thoughtful, respectful debate still works. In the coming months, we'll be hosting more debates in the hope of continuing to model for our entire community the value of respectful debate and disagreement. And all of this is part of a larger project of seeking to instill in our campus, in our campus a more purposeful brand of pluralism. So let me close by saying that I'm not naive to how incredibly polarized our nation is right now and how slowly institutional change seems to come, especially, especially at universities. But I also harbor tremendous hope for the future of our democracy. And I believe that public and private universities, including ASU, Hopkins, and so many others, have a vital indispensable role to play in the project of restoring a vibrant civil society so long as they are willing to commit themselves to the renewal of civic education and towards modeling a genuine, a purposeful form of pluralism. Thank you again for the chance to be here uh, this afternoon and to speak with you all. For me, I wanted to begin by asking you about a, a paradox, which you don't openly address in the book, but it's there, which is that Johns Hopkins was the first research university established in the United States, a new model of education. And 150 years later, here you are as the president saying, you're, you're not suggesting that Hopkins shouldn't be that, but you're suggesting th the need to bring back something that perhaps was lost in the transition of the past you know, more than 100 years toward the dominance of, of research, cutting edge knowledge, knowledge production in universities and even in colleges. So uh, could you tell us what the, has, has anyone <laughs> seen this as a paradox the way I'm seeing it, that's, I'm, I'm very glad you're doing it, but it is, it is a distinctive voice coming from the, the president of a major research university to say this liberal arts core function of universities, let alone colleges, needs to be recovered and reprioritized as, as an important mission. So I, Paul, I, the way I see it is that I, I actually think 
that these ideas are not in tension with one another. Um, and again, when you think of, you know, as I understand what Hopkins and other research universities, like the one that we're sitting in is all, are all about, it's, a, it's really an effort to advance knowledge, to be able to interrogate knowledge, to bring new perspectives and insights, to test received wisdom and so forth. And I think that enterprise um, is important in every discipline at the university. It's, an, it's important in the uh, humanities as it is in the, in the natural sciences. So I, I actually think in this case uh, that this um, need to rediscover uh, this important responsibility that Washington and intermittently as I've described uh, the uh, country and leaders of understanding of being important role of the university is indeed fully capable of being integrated into an environment where we're still fully committed to the research mission and to advancing knowledge. I mean, again, I've always, you know, I've always understood as you know, people see the research university um, as um, as being framed around that research enterprise. But I always add, it's research and education. We, we can do both of these things, and indeed, that's the case that we make for the research university, is the um, inextricable linkage between the research that our faculty and graduate students, and even our undergraduate students do, and the education mission of the schools. So I, 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 I don't think these ideas are uh, naturally in tension with one another. I think we made a series of decisions along the way to depreciate uh, this, uh, this responsibility around civics education. But I don't think it falls inevitably from the character of the, uh, of the research university. Uh, you mentioned in the book uh, a scholar who's been a friend of our little school, our little department here at ASU, Danielle Allen, and her advocacy of uh, all university students needing to know the operator's manual, I think was right. the metaphor uh, that you cite. And so when you, ta when you talked about the, in your remarks about the, in a way, K through 16 educational system needing to, uh, across that range of ages, um, recommit to civic education. K-12 can't do it alone. Higher education can't do it alone, it needs to be. I was thinking of Danielle because, uh, four years ago, I guess it is now, uh, she invited our little department to be part of a grant she wanted uh, with a team of people on the East Coast, Harvard, Tufts, and iCivics. Uh, she wanted us to be part of applying for a grant to the Federal Department of Education to do a study of K-12 public school civics education. But similarly to the remarks you made, her insight was she knew that I was intellectually conservative, so to speak, she wanted to make sure that this was a national consensus approach. You mentioned 1619 and 1776, right? That the, the full complexity of history scholars, political science scholars, others, and, and a range of national views would be covered in, in this study. But the, the challenge is, as you mentioned, we are so polarized. Higher education is polarized, as we've heard discussed today. And so, in a way, the one challenge right now is how to get K-12 teachers, boards of education, schools, but also university faculty to grapple with this question of civic knowledge and civic virtues when it's so easy to say, oh, that's just a mess. Right. That, that's a, that means you're going to get into a food fight. That means name calling. I, we, we've got other better things we can do, and it happens at both levels, K-12 and it happens at higher education. So what, what are your thoughts about how, how to move uh, out of the, that problem of, of polarization? So um, Paul, as you know, Daniel Ellen and others are um, part of a bipartisan group that's been working for some years now to develop what is a model curriculum for essentially uh, K to 12 education. Um, and it is, again, it is, it, to my mind, it's really quite inspiring. This is just now at the K to 12 level, but to see the extent to which um, people from left and right uh, uh, who are thoughtful about these issues 
actually can agree uh, about it, such a curriculum, that I don't think it's so starry-eyed to imagine this enterprise working. There is a curriculum, and there are, it's not the only project. Uh, the one that Danielle's involved in is not the only project like this. So there are others that are taking place in this country. And I think it is conceivable to imagine that you can do that at the K to 12 level. Now, you know, to the extent that um, this process at the level of state or even uh, local politics becomes more polarized and, you know, you know, questions of, you know, can you actually have critical perspectives on democracy? When do you introduce them and so forth? I think that hobbles the enterprise. But I think the fact is that there's that this has been done and done thoughtfully and comprehensively. It's a dazzling curriculum. I've spent time looking at it. Um, I think should give us the confidence that this is indeed possible at the K to 12 level. I think you know the same is you know to my mind can be true at the university level. Um, you know Stanford University um, has spent a lot of time thinking about this issue and came up with a core course. You know, it was a lot of intense debate, as I understand it, it um, as these debates go. Um, it was challenging um, at times. But ultimately, uh, they have agreed on a course uh, that is um, taught by multiple instructors. There's an agreed set of core ideas that are, you know, that, is, that are gonna be communicated through or taught through the course. And it's working. Um, and so I think these kinds of demonstration projects give us, uh, give us um, confidence that with goodwill and a real commitment to moving this forward, we can in fact do it in this country. I think one of the real challenges we have now um, at the post-secondary level is the reality that we're doing remediation, you know, that we're not actually imagining what a, um, what a great continuation of civics education will look like at the post-secondary level, assuming that students have had exposure to this model curriculum from K to 12. Instead, you know, if we're gonna take this seriously, we have to um, acknowledge, frankly, that the failure that, again, I've described in my remarks a few moments ago, when I look out um, at, you know, at the students uh, whom we're admitting to Hopkins and you know, recognize that a lot of these ideas that we think are so foundational to this country, are, they're just not exposed to them. And so this is, this is our moment to get this right. You know, again, what I, what I worry about is that again, just given uh, the, um, the challenges and the level of, um, of, of polarization that we see in this country, and even you know the much more, as John Shields referred to earlier, the superficial renditions of political theory of ideas, both from left and right, that our students are getting in much less serious sources. If we don't do this at the university level in a serious way, I think the reality is um, uh, they won't get it. Um, and uh, again, I think to the extent that. Um, you know that, as as I remarked, that I you know I feel as so many others do that there's still a, a, a fragility to this moment. I think it again becomes that much more important that we take this enterprise seriously of building that kind of experience. It, it's a striking set of passages in your book when you talk about that freshman you know the experience that uh, these are elite. This is a very selective university, Johns Hopkins <laughs> University. You, you, one would think that right. these students have had an excellent education across the range of disciplines to prepare them for elite university study, and yet you, you, know, you and, and, and Grant and, and Philip say, this was, it was shocking to you how little these students and in it, fact it, knew. It, it may be that, you know, again, um, it may be that my little postage stamp pers uh, perspective on this is in fact in fact, informed by the fact that we have a student body that leans more to the sciences and engineering, um, and the life sciences in particular, than per, uh, perhaps other uh, other schools. And it's there, you know, that the uh, disparity between the background that students have in these uh, in these subjects and these ideas between science and non-science students is pretty striking. With with the science students having much less exposure and familiarity with these concepts. So it, it may be that in part, um, I've got a, a bias sample, but nevertheless, um, you know, I, 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 when, I, when I talk to 
uh, colleagues at other institutions. I, I don't think this is I don't think this is wholly anomalous. One of the background realities for for this is it's not just a Johns Hopkins, an admittedly elite institution. It's the reality that only about a third of Americans will study for a, uh, and, and earn a bachelor's degree. So in a way, university graduates, college graduates are set to be leaders in different ways, in different professions, different life paths that they might choose. And if they, you know, excellent engineering students graduating from Hopkins or from ASU, excellent natural sciences students graduating from right. Hopkins or from ASU, if they are not aware of the both the, the the rights of being citizens of a free liberal democracy, but also the duties, the then how is that going to shape right. their particular career paths, uh, and, and what, their and leadership roles? I agree with you, and we make the case to them that, you know, particularly the kinds of technologies and, um, and capabilities that they are developing the sciences and, um, and in engineering, it, I think it really behooves them to have some understanding of the consequences that these technologies, these capabilities will have for democratic life and that they've, they've got at least the capacity to be able to contextualize this and again, to have views on how you think about these issues. So I, I, again, I think this is really urgent. Yeah, so if anyone is interested, the study that, that President Daniels and I have been talking about of, of K-12 is called Educating for American Democracy. And you can look, use that as the URL, educatingforamericandemocracy.org, study of K-12 and a framework curriculum that different states and districts can use. Yeah, it's a terrific curriculum. Use. It's really impressive. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the particular challenge of a university leader or a national study, anybody suggesting to university faculty, you ought to change your curriculum because you, you forthrightly call for, in the book, a democracy requirement. There ought to be a core civic knowledge oriented course for every graduate of every university and college in the country. So I just wanted to ask you, sort of put you on the spot. It's, uh, faculty don't like to be told what to do. You know, <laughs> Fa faculty committees, faculty senates, faculty curriculum committees don't like anybody telling them you ought to change your core curriculum, you ought to do things like, so what you mentioned, the steps that have been taken during your time at, at Johns Hopkins to elevate this set of issues, uh, but, but do you have any insights for us? I'll, I'll mention it here, Arizona State University has been nudged by the Board of Regents in the state, along with the University of Arizona, Northern Arizona University, we've all been nudged for several years now to adopt, in effect, a, a core knowledge civics requirement. Here it's been called American Institutions. Yeah. But it's been four years <laughs> and, and ASU has still not come up with a plan to, to institute such a requirement. So what insights do you have <laughs> from the Hopkins case study of, of how a, a faculty could be moved beyond skepticism of for different reasons to say yeah, this is a priority? So I guess uh, several things, and again, I think the story is still being written at Hopkins. Where uh, uh, we did a very comprehensive reform of our undergraduate uh, curriculum a few years ago, and um, and there's a series of follow-on items. One of them is, you know, the precise nature beyond the various efforts that I've talked about, but the precise nature of how we think about a democracy requirement and in the curriculum. Is it a mandatory course? Is it multiple courses? How do you put shape? And definition to those courses and so forth. So I, you know, I, I this is this is very much a work in progress. So I, you know, I, I answer the question with some humility um, as to precisely how this will even play out at my own institution in terms of advancing the agenda. But I guess I think there's a few things that, are, at least to my mind, are important. One is um, I think that within the academy, and I think as indeed more generally in our society. I think there is a sense that this is a serious problem, that again, I go back to January 6th, that is a serious moment for this country. And I think, again, um, wherever you fall on the political spectrum, it's really striking. Um, you, know, you, you, you see the polls and the extent to which people both on left and right really worry about the durability of American democracy. Now they may have different views as to what ails our democracy, but we are worried in increasingly larger percentages expressing that concern over a host of other uh, more temporal issues than in the past have commanded our attention. So that's, that to my mind is 
a good place to start is to say, we're in a moment where we worry about the fragility of our institutions and uh, the fragility of this experiment. And if that's a serious moment, as, as so many of us feel that it is, then the question then turns back on us. What are we going to do about it? What responsibility do we have in this moment to step up and say, we're going to do something hard? You know, and I, I think, so I think in some sense it first starts with the framing. You know, do, are we blithe about this? Do we think this is just, a, you know, a moment in our, um, in our country's history where um, it's kind of business as usual, or do we feel we're in a moment where you know, the political sciences use the, the term critical juncture, but are we at a critical juncture? I think a lot of people would say that that's so, that's where we are. And if that's so, then I think it opens up to the discussion about um, how you respond to that. And to my mind, I've always found my role as president to, um, to play um, a role in sort of challenging, in raising questions, in, in looking to my faculty colleagues to help me figure out answers and to help the institution to figure out answers. But I do so with a great deal of respect and deference to the nature of the collegial enterprise. And to my mind, um, you know, it's, um, I'm, I'm gonna take a somewhat ecumenical approach to this. That is to say, I think that we should be firm on our determination that we resolve with or respond to with uh, some resolve uh, the seriousness of the moment with, with a set of perturbations to the way in which we tackle these issues. But um, the way in which we do that, whether it is one mandatory course that every student takes um, through you know, one, one, one set of lecturers, or whether it's multiple courses under agreed upon curriculum, or whether it is um, you know, in the case of other institutions like uh, Purdue, where it's you know uh, podcasts that you listen to and then take a test on, or or attend uh, attend lectures and uh, seminars around these issues. I I I don't you know on that. Um, I think that you know rather than seeing this being done to the academy, my view is that this is a challenge we all share, and I. I look to my colleagues to help me figure this out and, and to figure this out for the institution. So I think this, 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 this sense of, of taking seriously the norms of faculty governance and the role that they play in shaping and um, delivering the curriculum is an important starting point for this. And then, and then, and then um, I would finally say, you know, one of the things I've always believed that's really important um, whenever you're trying to do reform within the academy is to um, offer lots of opportunities for experimentation, for evaluation, you know, to see what works, what hasn't, um, and to then, you know, imagine that uh, through that kind of iterative process, if again, we're all agreed that this is a serious moment for higher education, that we have a responsibility to do something, and then to basically to let people experiment to try different approaches, and then and then hopefully, you know, I think the academy is best when we use principle and facts uh, to evaluate whether we're we're making a difference or not. So, to my mind, I think I think you know this issue is not dissimilar to any of a number of issues around reform of the academy that. I, at least to my, in my experience over the decades, has been really important. One last question for me, and then we, we have a microphone here in the, in the center of the room, so I encourage uh, audience members here to think of questions you'd like to uh, pose. So a final question uh, about the idea of purposeful pluralism, speaker events, d debate and dialogue events. We have tried to do that in, in our school here at ASU for several years uh, with uh, S Senator Tom Daschle and Senator John Kyle, Democrat and Republican, yeah. show that they, we set up a little debate about tax policy and yeah. other things, you know, disagree with each other, but that also show the phrase you use, civic friendship, that across partisan philosophical lines they could be reasonably discussing and disagreeing. 
We've done it with Nadine Strassen, former ACLU president, lawyer, law professor, and, and Judge Michael Mukasey, Attorney General Michael Mukasey. Strong disagreements on a range of issues, national security policy, constitutional interpretation, but here they were e exchanging views and disagreements reasonably with each other. Right. The most recent was two African-American scholars, Khalil Muhammad from Harvard, history professor, one of the authors in the 1619 Project, and Glenn Lowry from, from Brown. And that was entitled, Can We Talk Honestly About Race? Right? Can we have this kind of candid exchange of views and, and disagreements? So just a little bit more about what you've done at Hopkins. So I, I, part of me wants to say it's, it's good to uh, sponsor these kinds of events as the president of the university leader, but shouldn't we require it in some way? But maybe that's going too, you know, too, too hard, too fast. But so have you put your own money, so to speak, behind yeah. this? Or you've got deans who are sponsoring these events to try and begin to shift the culture at, at Johns yeah, Hopkins? So, so yes, so we, we're, yeah, we are, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm a law and economics scholar, as you said, so uh, as you acknowledge, and so um, incentives matter. Incentives, and, yeah, yeah. And yes, and so we're doing this both uh, under the aegis of the Agora Institute, which I, which I uh, um, uh, have uh, referred to earlier, where uh, basically it's, 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 it's a, um, an institute that's really focused on the uh, multiple challenges facing uh, democracy, and they've taken a leadership role in this issue. So they're organizing a number of these events. Um, but I will say that, you know, I. Um, I think at the same time that we organize events, what I'm really trying to see happen is that um, we'll basically we're putting startup funds uh, to, uh, to the students uh -huh. and saying, bring ideas to us, self-assemble, bring, bring these ideas and we'll, 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 we'll support them financially. So again, it's just one of these places, one of these moments where you can kind of put your thumb on the scales for, you know, trying to see this kind of activity happen. And again, I, I just, what I worry about, and I really felt this at times, you know, in my academic leadership career, that I've often felt that um, instead of playing a role as educator, I'm an umpire. And being called into that role, you know, to call balls and strikes across different, you know, uh, different disputes uh, that have taken place in the, uh, in the university, and I'd much rather, again, give agency to the students to work, to have these debates and discussions among themselves and take on hard issues. And again, to do so in a way that ultimately they can see that you can disagree vehemently with one another, but you can make progress. You know, as I like to say to the students is that it's really striking how um, often people have views of the differences that divide us but you often don't know truly is are those differences rooted in deeply uh, deeply held and divergent <coughs> values, or in fact, actually, is there some overlap of the values? And what you're really debating, or or what divides you, is different views on the empirical state of the world. Well, if it's a latter, it turns out you know maybe through um, more. Uh, um, empirical work through um, various kinds of processes in which we you know, talk to one another and kind of figure out um, what are the interesting empirical questions to ask, what do we agree upon, what do we not uh, agree upon, I think we start to narrow the chasm. So again, I, this is why I think it's a really important um, set of habits that we cultivate uh, in our student body. And again, I'll just, I'll just you know, finish, Paul, on this point which, you know, when you think about where we are in America right now um, and, you know, the great geographic separation that, of course, has commanded a lot of attention in the literature that, you know, we're, again, the coast versus flyover zone, so on, all these sort of framing, which I, you know, may be exaggerated, but nevertheless contains uh, more than a kernel of truth uh, in these ideas and, and how we understand this country. But it just seems to me that what's really exciting about our universities today is how heterogeneous our student populations are. And I'd say particularly over the last couple of years, as we've turned our attention 
to building on the work that we've done in terms of increasing access to racial and ethnic minorities and so forth, but really now focusing on socioeconomic status and again, building good pipelines here. We're just, we're one of the few places in America where we actually penetrate these clusters or enclaves of homogeneity. And so to have all these students and this diversity together and not having hard conversations, exploring these differences, I think is a really lost opportunity. And maybe one of the few opportunities that we have in American society today, you know, without, without having um, mandatory military or national service, how often do we bring truly diverse communities together and have them live cheek by jowl with one another? And again, as I said, like even this move on removing our students' ability to opt uh, out of you know, being placed yeah. where students are wholly different, so I, think this is, I think this is impactful. Yes, well, thank you. So now we have uh, time for questions from the audience. Um, uh, please uh, do uh, keep your question brief and please do pose a question rather than make a statement. So. Uh, so it would seem to me uh, that uh, given your interest in democracy as a value of the university, that inevitably leads to a greater emphasis, I would think, on ideological diversity within the university, since that would be a model for democracy, which might not be completely captured just by parachuting in a few debates, but by having that be a uh, continual part of the stream of university living led by the faculty. And yet, of course, you talk, universities are described by one of your uh, colleagues at Princeton, generally a kind of blue bubble. And so one question is, what are you, can one do about that? And let me just add one other complication of that. Uh, there's a very interesting paper, which I mentioned in my talk, uh, the. Uh, legal Academy's ideological uniformity. And one of its points was that what is driving the Legal Academy even farther to the left than it was, was the greater emphasis on the hiring of minorities and women. Because statistically, at least those who become professors, are farther to the left than the already left-wing median professor. So isn't there then a tension between the relentless focus on diversity uh, of faculty in that term and the ideological diversity that you might think that this new emphasis, democratic emphasis, this democratic model of a university demands. Okay, thank you. So I'm not, I'm not familiar with the study that uh, you've referred to, but I'd, I'd, I'd be interested, obviously, if, uh, if you could uh, uh, share it with me. But look, I, I start off, and I've said this in a number of different contexts, and in some sense, I was here for the last panel with uh, uh, John Shields uh, uh, spoke, and I actually have some considerable sympathy for, at least to my mind, um, you know, the notion that, um, at least that I believe, and I've asked the question of many students uh, uh, in the uh, social sciences and humanities, you know, do they feel um, that they're being exposed to a broad uh, spectrum of, of political ideas? And in particular, are ideas in the you know, great conservative tradition associated with this country, are they getting exposed to that? Um, despite what is clearly the case um, across higher education, and particularly elite at higher education of the left tilt? And the answer, um, I think, and I, don't, I, I think it's an accurate one, is they are getting exposure. And I think, a, I think a fair exposure to these ideas, a faithful exposure to them. But having said that, I do feel there's a really serious problem, and I think it's John really put his, uh, his finger on it. I really worry about not having people working from uh, sympathetically and working to advance uh, understandings, to advance scholarship um, in, uh, in these fields um, from a conservative tradition. And you know, to my mind, I think the most serious issue is, is, is uh, what it's doing to this country, that when you're not, it goes back to this belief in debate and so forth, but when you don't have scholars um, who are working from this tradition or present on campus, who are being uh, forced to confront 
students, faculty who are skeptical uh, from the left. Um, I think it, it impoverishes their work, and I think as it impoverishes the work of colleagues on the left, just not to have this testing and this kind of contestation. And I think particularly in this country, what it's meant is that instead of having um, the, a lot of uh, conservative scholarship around social, political, economic phenomenon uh, being developed on our campus, it's going to think tanks in Washington which I think just kind of further exacerbates the divides in this country. So I, I, really, I really do think that there's, um, there's an importance to looking at this issue and trying to understand how we actually uh, think seriously about uh, bringing faculty working from this tradition onto our campuses. And look, and I've, I've had uh, these, uh, these discussions with colleagues and I said, look, uh, when you're thinking about what's important um, for your department at this point in time, you know, the debates over you know, the economics department, do you want qualitative or quantitative economics? Do you need a, do you need a historian, uh, an economic historian? You know, just, we, you know every, every discipline, whatever they're going to the hiring market, are thinking about these issues and trying to uh, consider what's really important for their discipline and point in time. I think it's in this context that um, this sense of do we have a responsibility to make sure that there are scholars uh, who are being uh, cultivated at the graduate level and then ultimately making their way onto our faculty that are representing a political tradition that half the country uh, sees as important to their understanding of uh, phenomena that they confront in their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, at various times, I've made the claim that all college presidents are wimps, um, and I realize I now have to change that to say only most college presidents are wimps. <laughs> but my question is about um, citizen of what? Um, I teach at Boston College, and the word that I see citizen connected to most frequently is citizen of the world. Global citizen. Global yeah. citizen. Right. And I make the claim, I've never been asked to vote in a global election. I've never been taxed by a global entity. I've never been drafted by global. In what sense am I a citizen? So my question is, you, I think, quite properly have said you're a citizen of the country. So how do you deal with this issue, and why do you think global citizenship has become, really surpassed the understanding of American citizenship? So um, I don't have a full story, it's a great question. I don't have a full answer as to you know, why this frame of global citizenship um, has the particular currency it does. Um, and you know, in particular, see it as in juxtaposition to this developing this idea of national citizenship. Um, at least to my mind, I actually think you start off and we're rooted in a political uh, community and a, com you know, a community, as you say, has a certain set of institutional arrangements and gives us a certain set of rights and obligations. I think you st to start off, you have to understand the nature of the experiment, the community you're in. And I think in truth, understanding that better um, will uh, prepare you for understanding the complexity of the world and so-called global citizenship. So I don't see these ideas as deeply in conflict with one another. I guess what I would say though is that uh, the, um, the denigration or at least the de-emphasis of national citizenship I think has really again been something that is a, is a, is a serious challenge not just for this country, but indeed for the world. And if we think about what this country represents to the global order and the architecture of what we sculpted in the, um, in the embers of the Second World War um, and the role that this country played, I think that there's much that is noble and inspiring about that. But to the extent that we don't, we don't take our own national role and obligation seriously and to the extent the world is looking at us as they looked with horror um, at, again, January 6th and other moments that we've had over the last several years in this country, I think we, 
um, we imperil the idea of global stability and the maintenance of an order that um, brings peace and the prospect of prosperity. So I, I think, again, even if you like and think that this idea of global citizenship is imperative, I think you first gotta think about this country and the, and the unique role that it plays in the global world, making sure that we're getting citizens who are capable of stewarding and, um, and sustaining uh, this enterprise, which is so consequential for the world. Thank you. You talk about promoting, um, sorry, you talk about promoting democracy and a purposeful engagement with diverse ideas. I'm curious about what happens when you encounter ideas that seem dangerous to democracy. One of the things that can complicate campus conversations is accusations of being anti-democratic. So how do you balance um, the need for purposeful pluralism with a focus on democratic values? So I, it's a, it's, again, it's a question that we're all continually confronting. You know, we confront in these various moments with really provocative speakers and when are lines being crossed. And again, you know, there's different institutions will draw those lines differently. But I, I, I think again, I come back to the liberal democratic exper experiment and the sense that at least to my mind, the conception of liberalism is that there is not one central truth and there's a sense of modesty in the claims that we make. And so, to, you know, for me, I think um, it's just really important, and particularly, as I like to say, the university is a place apart. It is, it is again, a place that has to take so seriously this idea that um, received wisdom may be wrong, and you've got to open up and find space, even if it, you know, creates risk of, uh, unsettling or angering people, you've got to find the space um, and the habits to let those arguments play out. Um, and so, you know, I, again, it's, 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 a, it's, I think, the distinct calling of the university as a site for this kind of, de of, of role that we play in liberal democracy that you've got to be particularly attentive to um, according as, as much scope as possible for this vigorous contestation. Thank you. Okay. Glad I get to ask my question now, carrying this thing as long as it's been a little bit of a burden. Um, so while I agree that the university uh, seems to for now bear great responsibility to educate our citizenry and the values and systems necessary for our republic, I am concerned by a statistic Dr. Carice had shared in passing, that only one third of Americans will study for and receive a bachelor's degree, that at most one third of the people who influence the destiny of this political experiment may be formally educated on that which is necessary to influence it well. If the university is limited in its ability to reach the American people, do we, as scholars, leaders, educators, and students, also bear some responsibility in cultivating and disseminating the lessons you hope become more frequently taught in institutions such as ASU or John Hopkins? If so, how might we fulfill said responsibility? Are we as individuals capable of having a meaningful impact, especially if institutions as great as universities do not possess influence great enough to reach even the majority of America? So, and, um, you know, the question you asked, um, in some sense, is a fall. It's, it goes to what happens if we do this well at, uh, at the university, if we've, if we've been able to, uh, to transmit an understanding of our traditions and values, the institutional arrangements which we think are important to sustain democracy, then what do you do with that? Um, and, I, and you know, here um, I have um, a less clear agenda for, for what follows other than um, it seems to me that um, if we discharge this responsibility with some conviction, um, I think it um, ultimately will um, help uh, restore at least uh, some of the standing of the university, particularly in quarters of the country that are deeply skeptical of it and see this as, you know, as places of meritocratic privilege, but without a sense of correlative responsibilities. Um, and so, you know, to my mind, um, I'd like to think that um, if we do this well, 
um, and I, um, I thought it's not the focus of my remarks uh, tonight, but I think a, you know, a big part of the story is making sure that um, more of the country is actually represented, and particularly those who come from uh, family circumstances where there is not uh, there's not a tradition of participating in higher education to come to our institutions. I think this is all part and parcel of the way in which uh, you um, restore um, greater faith and confidence in us. I also spend some time talking in the book about the role that we play in um, disseminating our ideas and the importance of worrying about the accuracy of our research, how we share data, open science and so forth, all of which I think you know, provide a more comprehensive answer to the question you've, you've raised. Thank you. Thank you. I now feel even greater reason to get to read your book. <laughs> it's, uh, it can be downloaded for free. <laughs> Actually, so that's yeah. important. You, would you just articulate that again? It can be downloaded, the book can now be downloaded for free from what, which was the website that you? It's, uh, it's on the press website. It's on the, the John Johns Hopkins, the John University. Hopkins University Press website. You can download a copy of the book uh, for free. The, the, uh, in one of the chapters of the, of the book in which I talk about the important role that universities play as a check on the exercise of public power, talk about you know, the idea that we aspire to be a place that generates facts, data, can check exercises, claims uh, to truth by other actors in society. And a big part of, uh, of the uh, large uh, thrust of that uh, discussion ultimately went in the direction of trying to show more of our work, showing more of our data a, a bit towards uh, thinking about open science and Grant, among others, felt very strongly if we're going to make a play to the importance of disseminating broadly our findings, we should start first and foremost with this book. And so ultimately, we decided uh, to, uh, to uh, put it up for free. Project Gutenberg early. Yeah, yeah exactly. indeed. Final question. No uh, pressure, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. final question. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, civic education and debates on campus. So I was wondering, um, does an emphasis on civic education distract and distort from the first uh, core purpose of the university, that being the pursuit of truth, or does the pursuit of truth come second to the political? I guess this goes back to the question Paul asked uh, <coughs> earlier. I, I, I guess I just don't see these as fundamentally in tension with one another. You know, I think we're capable of, of, of creating um, or sustaining a culture of skepticism, I and mean, that's what universities, we're skeptical about claims to truth. We interrogate them, we challenge them. We're contrarians by nature. That's the, you know, that's the magic of a university. I think we're capable of doing that. I think we're capable of doing deep interrogation of claims, of producing new knowledge. I think simultaneously, while, we're, while we are capable of actually uh, saying to our students, um, these are ideas around which this organize, or which we have organized our society. Um, this set of ideas has been particularly important in terms of, of resolving the kinds of very bloody uh, uh, battles and strife that has, uh, has uh, confronted society, plagued society for generations and to talk about the survival value of these political arrangements and what's required to be able to sustain and nurture them. I think we can do all of that together. I just, I just don't see a deep conflict in these roles. We're constantly thinking about you know, uh, the multiple goals of a university. You know, we, we, we educate, we research, we do tech transfer. Um, we, um, we, 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 we provide uh, services to uh, communities near us that are in need of health care or social service. I mean, we're just, we're complex institutions and we're capable of doing a number of things simultaneously. That's what makes us such interesting places. And I think this is, um, I think this is actually not that difficult to do. Thank you. Thank you. Ross, sure. Just a few closing remarks from me. Um, thank you to everyone for being here today. As I mentioned, uh, we have breakfast at eight o'clock for, for those who are here registered for the conference. And our first panel session is at nine. We have two uh, final panels uh, for the day and then lunch. 
for more uh, opportunity for conversation. I do want to say thank you to the staff and faculty of the school who organized everything. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, just the, I'm just the pretty face up here. So Marlene and Janelle and, and Paul Willett, our communications manager. So event staff, communications staff, uh, our faculty advisory committee organizing uh, the whole thing. Uh, so, and with, then with that, please, a rousing thanks to Ron Daniels for this marvelous <laughs> keynote. Thank you very much.